Hello? Hello? All right, great, thank you. Uh, while I was getting this set up, a uh, quick story. A friend of mine lives in Vancouver and actually took part in a pilot program with his car insurance company where they loaded a monitoring program on his smartphone um, and they were going to promise him a discount. And what happened was he uh, got a call one morning and they said, we clocked you doing 135 miles an hour last night. We really want to know what's going on. So he kind of scratched his head and went back to his, you know, thought back what happened. And it turned out that he had actually been on an airplane that had just landed and he turned on the phone just when the wheels touched down. <laughs> So we kind of explained that, and, then, and evidently they bought that, so uh, <laughs> be careful. Um, we're just going to have a little, uh, little time here to talk about a special study that IDC just completed, I guess about a month, a month and a half ago. Uh, it was at the behest of a uh, U.S. government customer, and it was really looking at a number of uh, cybersecurity strategies and approaches, big data uses, cyber profiles, um, and, and what's going on in, in the U.S. industry. Really, it's, it's the standard kind of story sometimes where, uh, especially when we find in the cybersecurity world, the people know what they're doing and they just want to make sure they're not missing anything. So they, they want to talk to other people. They want to find out what's going on. What are the, some of the techniques that maybe they could be applying to themselves? So this was really just a sense of going out and finding out what the best practices were. By the way, I, I changed my slide transition because I like the one that Leonardo used yesterday. So I've, I stole that, so thank you. Um, Really, the, the background and motivations for this is uh, in, in 2015, we did a, a, a somewhat less extensive study where we really just try to isolate the best practices. We tried to figure out who were the companies out there who are doing the best work, who are the ones that were doing not so good work, and who are the ones that were perhaps a really vulnerable to, to cybersecurity threats simply because of their, their lack of good practice. And, and what we, we, we ultimately found is that it's, it's pretty bad out there that most U.S. companies are, are, are dramatically unprepared to deal effectively with potential security breaches from both inside and outside uh, their, their, their firewalls. And um, there was a frequently voiced belief that most companies more or less felt that as long as they hadn't been hit, life was pretty good. Uh, that they must be doing something right. And so they would really start to aggressively look at cybersecurity once something bad really happened. That was a, a clear indicator of firms that were not doing the right thing. Uh, and, and most of them were, as I said, somewhat happy with the fact that, hey, we've never been hit. We must be doing something right. Um, that's kind of a scary thought when you get right down to it. Now, this current study that, we, as I said, we just completed, it zeroed in on the best practitioners best practitioners with a special em emphasis on large firms in the financial services and technology sectors uh, because those sectors were cited in the 2015 study as best practitioners and because they basically have very high value added data that they, they certainly need to protect, not more than anyone else, but it's, it's certainly something that, that they worry about more perhaps th than others. Uh, just, just to let you a little bit of, of how the sausage was made on this, we worked with the client for about six months to come up with the survey questions because asking, asking the right questions is critical. The problem is that sometimes you get mission creep when you deal with government people. And so ultimately, after six months, we had a 127-question survey. They were all open-ended questions. There were no pick A, B, C, or Ds. It was, what do you think about this, or, or what are you concerned with about that? And then after six months, when we finally got this massive survey done, they said, we'd really like the results in about four weeks. So we kind of went into high gear and, and, and really tried to, tried to go out and grab some, uh, some of the best people that we could talk to. In, in, in total, we ended up talking to 62 U.S. organizations. And what we did is we divided it up for the sake of expediency, but also we had some real serendipity in terms of the process that yielded some surprising and interesting results in and of itself just by the procedure. We, we did our, our, our more or less our standard one-on-one -on -one phone interviews that generally took about an hour to an hour and a half where we, we, we spoke one-on-one -on -one with these experts. But in addition to that, we also held focus groups where we had eight to 10 participants in four different cities, uh, New York, Chicago, Boston, and San Francisco, where we basically had 10 security experts sit around a table and we just kind of asked the questions all around. Now, because of non-disclosure agreements and such, uh, it, was, it was done in a way that companies weren't specifically identified, names weren't ultimately used. It was kind of, it was kind of surreal in some sense because you would just have the person's first name and the, the, the industry they came from. Now, this actually turned out to be a very interesting exercise because what we found is in, in these cities, you would have 10 of some of the leading cybersecurity experts who were at, at the top of their field in their company. And yet we found more often than not that no one around the table knew each other. They didn't know they existed. They had no way to contact each other. 
And they all kind of felt a little bit of regret about that. They, they expressed a de degree of concern about isolation and such. And at the end of these focus groups, you could see these guys all swapping cards saying, we really need to get together, we need to talk. It, it really speaks to this idea sometimes that isolation out there, because of the security implications of sharing too much, can also be a hindrance to these folks. And, and, and that, as I said, was an interesting unintended consequence of these, these focus groups. Here's, a, I think, a relatively impressive list of the folks that we talked to directly. And you can see there's, there's some, some pretty heavy hitters when it comes to the financial sector. Uh, we talked to folks in the medical field, manufacturing, um, and, and finance as well. And we tried to keep the list both in the U.S. and we tried to reach out internationally uh, when that became practical. Uh, the, the companies that we had inside the focus groups, as you can see, a, a larger group, uh, but again, a much more diverse uh, collection of folks. Um, it was, there was interesting guys that we spoke to, and what we tried to do was really hit some of the, some of the, the, the right job titles. We just didn't want to get folks who were familiar with, with cybersecurity, we wanted to get the folks who were making the decisions, or what we found time and time again, the guys that said, if, if we screw up, I'm the one that gets fired. So most of these guys that we spoke to were the ones that really felt that their job was on the line to do a good job and, and, and took this very seriously. Just a quick aside, um, what was fascinating about this is we found that most of the folks we talked to, and you know, I can say it, the gray beards in the company, most of these guys had been with the same company since they started their careers, in many cases 20 to 25 years previously. They were an IT guy and they kind of grew in responsibility and ultimately became kind of the chief cybersecurity uh, strategy person in their company. We didn't find a lot of cases where people moved from company to company. And I think we thought that was kind of interesting because the, the, the standard rap is, you know, it's hard to get security folks and it's hard to nail them down. And, and really when we talked to the senior folks, their, their opinion was everything that their company does is so specific. Their cybersecurity posture and policies are so unique to what their particular company does that they felt that the idea of moving would, would require them to start over completely. As one guy put it, he said it would be like going on Netflix and watching the first three episodes of a really good show and then saying, okay, now you have to go watch another show. You can't see how it ends. And so the idea that there's a lot of movement at the high end of cyber, the cybersecurity infrastructure is something is not as prevalent as what we ultimately heard from these folks about how hard it is to hire and keep people uh, in, with less experience. As we said before, uh, we have a wide range of... Um, Industries represented financial services, healthcare, um, inter, uh, entertainment, media, uh, manufacturing. Uh, I, just a, a quick aside, the healthcare guys, their job is absolutely impossible. Not only do they have to deal with cybersecurity stuff, but their, their issues with compliance and making sure that, that legal regulations are followed is, is, is just as onerous a process. And, and they actually have to wear two very heavy hats when it comes to dealing with both cybersecurity and all the legal issues that, that, that come with basically protecting patient data, privacy issues, and such. Uh, just to jump away from, from the key takeaways, um, Basically, we heard a rather common theme throughout our discussions is that cyber teams over the past two to three years have really evolved from what they used to call kind of a sleepy village operation, just keeping things going and making sure that the status quo was maintained. And now they're really involved in mission-critical enterprise units where the, where the pace is much quicker and the escalating cyber threats are something that really keeps them up at night. Um, we found out that cyber teams, you know, they've had to come up to speed quickly using the proven techno tools that are out there right now but few have had really time to investigate and implement big data analytics and all this. One of the, the sub-themes of, of this particular activity was to think about how much people are using big data analytics to help with their cybersecurity policy or, or their cybersecurity activities. And, and you know, just jumping to the chase, we found that most of them simply don't have the time to do that just yet. And even if they did, the rarity of data scientists who can do cybersecurity, they're just not out there. And we talked to a lot of companies that had that had big data analysis going on in their lines of business. And they said, we can't get access to those guys. We simply cannot convince our managers that we need to bring those people over to us to do the work when they're over there making more money for the company. Uh, so they, felt, they all felt that, that was a really big issue. And, and what we found is that most of them just simply feel that they won't be able to implement big data analytics into their cybersecurity infrastructure, but they hope that the vendors who supply their software security will. So they're looking for companies like McAfee and such to throw this stuff over the fence and say, oh, okay, here's your, here's your new big, your big uh, data application feature. Just pull it down on the menu and, and load and go. That's their hope. Um, no one seemed optimistic that that was going to be realized anytime soon. 
We talked a little bit about the fit within a, the organization. The, the, the customer really wanted to know how do cybersecurity teams operate within a larger company. And really what we found out in many cases is that these teams report directly to the CEO. They are not involved in, in, in the typical wiring diagrams in the line of business, that they basically have a direct channel to the CEO and the board, mainly because they said the CEO and the board can be sued if, 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 if there's problems found with their cybersecurity infrastructure. That's a great way to establish a channel. Um, what this really meant, this, this, this wonderful channel they had, is that when it came to things like justifying their existence, at some level they didn't have to. They, they didn't have to belabor the issue with ROI investments. They didn't have to say, if you don't do this, this is what it'll cost. They basically said, this is what we need to do. And they got most of the budget that they needed, really without a lot of questions asked. Um, I'm just going to keep going here. We asked them a little bit about breach plans. And, and I put this slide up here because I found it pretty interesting in the sense that some companies had a, their breach plan. What do you do the day after or the minute after you realize something bad has happened? Some of them had 100% IT-centric uh, plans. They would basically say, OK, here's what we need to do from an IT perspective. Shut these down, bring these on, back this up, those kinds of things. A lot of companies said our, the IT response portion is very tiny. It's only maybe 20%. It's the public relations. It's, it's basically the things that you need to do from a legal or publicity manner that a lot of these companies um, view as a primary response to a threat. And really, this backs up what we saw in the 2015 study, which basically said a lot of these companies are not, strictly speaking, worried about the financial hit of a breach. In other words, something happens, somebody comes in and maybe steals some money or, or transfers some, some assets or something. It's really more, and, and the reason they're not worried about that is because they can foist that off on insurance companies or the finance companies that are, that are working along with them. It's not that bad a hit. The incalculable risk is what happens to the reputation going forward. So yeah, Target takes a hit and loses some money, but now they have to look at a loss of an income stream that may extend out months, if not years, into the future. And that's the thing that scares most companies today about cyber breaches. And that's why, in many cases, their breach plan is really geared towards basically damage control more than dealing with the cyber threat directly. Um, we asked a little bit about frameworks. Uh, frameworks are the, the basic. Um, consider it a template for how you implement a security plan. And we really wanted to know who, who, what kind of frameworks these guys start with. And when we asked them, and this is a result of, of, of one of the survey questions, which was basically which ones to use. And these are all kind of standard frameworks. But what we've heard from everyone is no one uses these frameworks as nothing more than a first draft. And no one uses a single framework. They take the best from the frameworks that you see here. They look at a bunch of them. And that's, that's where they start. That's where they start implementing a custom-crafted security policy unique to their company. Uh, as I said before, we asked about big data analytics for cybersecurity. And we found, as I said earlier, it's, it's really still in their infancy in private sectors. And this was actually a rather interesting, again, sub-theme that the client was interested in. The sense was they're not really up to speed on big data for cyber, what's going on in the commercial sector. And kind of when we came back and said, we're looking and we can't find really too much going on out there, they kept saying, well, are you sure about that? Because we, we really think there's got to be some big stuff going on out there. We said, look, we simply can't find these, these, these uh, we can't find a lot of evidence for it. You know, I talked about the surveys running from an hour to an hour and a half, and there was a large section in the middle, about a third of the, 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 the survey, that basically said, OK, do you do big data? And that was a great you know, decision point. Because if the person said, yes, you had 50 or 60 more questions, if he said, no, you jumped 50 or 60 more questions. And we did a lot of jumping. We just basically got folks that said, we're, we're not doing big data. Now, what's interesting about this is we didn't really define big data. And so a lot of the companies that, we said, that said, yes, they're doing big data, they were using their own definition. And really, when we started asking them things like, well, what kind of tools do you do your big data with? Uh, we started to get a sense of, well, people are using Splunk and some other stuff that are not typical big data analytics tools. So even their definition of big data was suspect. And I will point out, remember, we had 62 surveys. And these are the, these are the 39 guys that we didn't jump the 50 questions for. So there's, there's definitely a sense that we're really starting to narrow down. And the results we got, I don't think, really indicated there's a lot that we're missing a lot in terms of there's a whole bunch of guys out there who are doing some really good big data stuff, but we just weren't able to find them. Um, I'm just going to keep going because I know that clock is ticking. We asked them a little bit about key performance indicators. What do they use to measure their cybersecurity uh, practical or their, their, their successes? Most of them basically rely on relatively simple metrics, number of thwarted attacks, and time to identification of, of, of 
uh, of attackers. Uh, again, the, the big thing was, have we been hit or haven't we not? Um, didn't find any great sophisticated um, indicators there. We asked them about threat sources. Uh, we asked them a little bit about you know, the insider versus external threats. Um, and really, what we found is uh, trust no one. Uh, the idea is that you really shouldn't belabor the issue of the person inside or is the person outside. If you have good cybersecurity policy, that's really not going to matter, that a good plan will help you on either way. One of the little takeaways from all this is when we're, one of the things that keeps these guys up at night is that the idea of bring your own device is now a given in, in, in the commercial world, that when a, a new employee shows up, he doesn't, want a, he doesn't want a piece of hardware given to him. He wants his hardware and he wants all the software that he needs to do his job loaded on that. And they said that's, that is now a, a given and, and the cybersecurity policies have to reflect that reality. He said luckily most people are not all that loath to have a little piece of their, their, their own device partitioned off for security reasons. So that, that's a good thing. But again, that's, that's a reality that no one is arguing anymore. Um, we asked a little bit about where the threats come from. And you know, we asked about internal threats here. And the interesting thing here is we, the idea of unintentional and unknowing employees, the idea that your inside threat isn't really an inside threat, it's an unwitting inside threat being driven by an external source. And so really what we found out was that education at the user level is a really important aspect in the commercial space. These guys definitely try to educate users. We talked to one company, and I thought this was kind of fascinating, is they actually monitor social media events in order to help short circuit cyber attacks on their employee base. And the example one of the guys gave in the focus groups was the minute that Prince had, they had announced that he had died, they sent out an email to all of their employees basically saying, if you get any emails that say things like, want to see a Prince tribute video, click here. Don't click there. And, and so basically, they're, they're, they're constantly trying to push out insights to their employees. It's really a, an issue of training, and to a degree I, I didn't expect. Uh, external threats here, um, these are all the, the standard ones. Um, ransomware came up, but I think that was in the news a lot. A lot of companies were worried about ransomware at the time. Um, oddly enough, the, the Russian government isn't, isn't singled out here at all, but maybe that's just during election time. Uh, we asked them a little bit about threat intelligence sources, where they get information from, from the outside world. There's these services that provide you with insights and details. And we talked to one guy, and he said he talked to, he, he basically subscribes to 40 different threat intelligence sources. And we said, why 40? And he said, because if I only subscribed to 39, and the 40th one had the thing that kept me from being tripped up, I'd feel like an idiot. So he subscribes to 40 different ones. Uh, I don't know how you keep track of that. I don't know how you drive that into your, your business process, but this is definitely a threat thriving business uh, in terms of just getting insights on what's going on out there. And most of them said, we want real-time constant updates. Uh, we want to be able to do this as we want somebody out there telling us what we need to be looking at on a near constant basis. We want to drive that into our, our cybersecurity process as quickly as we can. Ultimately, though, when you, when you started to, to talk to these guys about what really mattered in terms of their policy, they said this is a people versus people process. This is not just having the best tools or the best framework or the best breach plan. This is really about hiring the best people, supporting them like crazy, and basically just making sure that they can do the job they need to do. And again, the, 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 the sense of commitment here, I, I, these guys don't change jobs. They're, they're, they're really wedded to the kinds of companies they work for, to, to their cybersecurity vision and their mission. And, and, and that, was, that was really drove home in, in, in every interview I took place in every focus group I was at. And ultimately, all had adjusted their philosophies to meet the business requirements of their companies. They all had bought into the business model and adopted the cybersecurity strategy to meet that business model. We talked, we had, one of the questions we asked is, how many potential vulnerable endpoints, access points, do you have to deal with? And the guy from Nike said 50 million, because that's how many people go to the Nike website every year. And he said, if I can't provide data to them on a, on a fast, effective basis, we don't do business. So I have to think, I have to, I have to be as open to the business model as I possibly can while still dealing with the fact that there's 50 million ways into my company that I need to worry about. And it was getting into the, it was getting access to the business model that, that kept these guys working forward. It wasn't to nail down a secure cybersecurity infrastructure. Um, ultimately, we asked the question about, you know, what's, what's going on, where, what does the future look like? And they all said, 
uh, guess what? It's not going to get any better. We, we're just going to be we're just going to be working harder. Uh, we're going to have to stay on top of these problems uh, much more aggressively. Uh, and and the thing that we found when we mentioned about the big data question is they said yes, we're not doing much, but. One of the things they worried about is they said, we don't know what the bad guys are up to. We don't know what the opportunities or options or a potential is of an adversary to use big data analytical techniques to, to, to basically leverage or improve their cyber attack capabilities against them. And that was this, this great, you know, whenever somebody would mention that, there'd be this kind of hush over the room like, we don't even know where to begin to start to grapple with that issue. That's something that I think a lot of people are going to be worried about in the near future. Um, and, and I don't think solutions are around the corner at this point. Um, the, the one last thing I want to get here is, um, as I said, the sense of, the, of isolation within these folks was, was absolutely horrific. They, they all felt that they were working on their own. They really didn't have a place to discuss things. And someone at one point, you know, said, well, you know, you can go to like Black Hat, you know, these, these cyber conferences. And like I said, you know, when I go to Black Hat, I don't even want to know what room I'm staying in. I'm not going to swap cybersecurity practices in, in, in a place like that where, you know, half the guys or perhaps all of them, you know, have, have, have at least one or two agendas uh, by attending. So the idea of some kind of cybersecurity safe haven was something that we, we kind of kicked around and, and thought, is there, is there a place where one could establish an exchange for ideas and information or insights that could be viewed as safer? than going to an outside conference or something, uh, something that's, that's much more public, that's not at least vetted in some capacity. And the idea of some kind of federal initiative was kicked around. But, but it's, it's, there's a need out there right now, and, and, and the solution is not obvious, but it's something I think a lot of these folks would, would ultimately gravitate to um, if, if, if it became available. So that, that was the end of it. And, and the, the, the issue right now is that um, we, we presented the final report, which turned out to be about 150 or 60 pages, lots and lots of tables and, and, and analysis and such. And we're, we're trying to negotiate, if you will, at least have discussions with the sponsor to see if we can at least make the executive summary uh, of, this, of this report available publicly. Because as I said, there's a lot of really interesting insights in here that I think, I think a lot of people could benefit from seeing. So hopefully you'll hear more about that in the near future. Um, but as I said, it's still under discussion right now. Okay, that's...